Hi, welcome back to another video of my series covering how to program on bare metal STM32. Today, we're going to uncover the UART protocol and implement a simple UART transmit receiver driver to make an echo program, which means that we can send data to the STM32, and once our MCU receives it, it will send that data back, and we can observe that through the serial monitor. First, I should provide a summary of the UART protocol. It stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Slash Transmitter. It is a serial communication protocol, which means the data is transferred bit by bit or one bit at a time, and it should use only one wire for transmission. In contrast, parallel communication means that all bits are transferred simultaneously and requires more wires. UART has two wires, TX for transmitting and RX for receiving. Note that the TX line of one device must be wired to the other's RX and vice versa. The A in UART stands for asynchronous. This means that the transmitter and receiver agree on the clock speed for the data transmission, and there is no clock signal. Compared to other protocols like I2C, a clock signal is needed so the receiver can know when one bit starts or ends, and that makes this process synchronous. For the STM32, you may notice that the name of the protocol is USART with an S. This is because you can configure it to be used in synchronous mode, and this is where the S comes from. To make asynchronous communication possible, both sides must use the same settings, and we'll see some of it. Baud rate refers to the connection speed expressed in baud, or the number of signal changes per second. If you are confused as to how that is different to bit rate, then bit rate refers to the number of bits transmitted per second. Baud rate and bit rate are the same if the type of signal in discussion is one bit. UART transmits data by organizing it into packets, so the packet format should be the same on both sides. The data, 5 to 9 bits, is packed between what is known as a start and a stop bit. The start bit only has one bit, and its value is always zero. The stop bit can consist of either one or two bits. The value of the stop bit is always one. Parity is a way to check if there is an error in the transmission process. Flow control is a mechanism to prevent buffer overflow when the receiver cannot process all the data in time. The normal setting is eight data bits, one start bit, one stop bit, and no parity. And in this video, we don't configure it, so our STM32 should use this setting by default. Before we delve into the coding part, I should make a note about hardware. There are many USART modules, but I will select USART 2 here. This is because for those who own a Nucleo or Discovery board, the USART 2 is connected to ST-Link, and you can communicate between your PC and USART on USB. However, I'm not using one of those. My ST-Link V2 doesn't provide a serial port, so I need a separate USB to serial converter, and I'm using a PL2302 module in this case with the ground connected together and TX, RX of the two devices connected. This should require a little bit of configuration. If you have a development board already, then skip this unless you want to learn something new. For those using Windows, you probably need a driver, and it's fairly easy to download it from the internet. By default, I'm using Linux as my working environment, so I don't need to install anything. When I first tried it out, 9,600 was the default baud rate, so I set it to 115,200, which is a faster yet still standard option through this command. If you're using Windows, you probably need to adjust the settings in the device manager. I'm checking if this module works by wiring TX and RX together. This way, if there is no malfunction, when I send a message, it should echo back. I'm opening the serial monitor in VS Code and verifying that this module is working as expected. Coming back to the coding part, First, we will handle the initialization of the USART2 module. The steps are, figure out the clock source to enable USART2, select the alternate function mode for the pins that USART2 use, configure the baud rate, and then the transfer direction. Finally, we can enable the USART2 module. In the block diagram, we see that USART2 is connected to APB1 bus. Open the reference manual, look for the clock enable register of APB1, and bit at position 17 will enable USART 2 module. Now, which physical pins are connected to USART 2 module? To answer this, we need to see the alternate function mapping in the datasheet. In case you are wondering why this is called alternate function mapping, 
The default function for these pins is GPIO. Any other function, like I2C or UART, is considered an alternate function. Here you can see that pin A2 is the TX line, whereas A3 is the RX line. Note that they are put under column AF7, which means the peripheral that this type of alternate function uses is USART. Open Chapter 8 in the reference manual about GPIO configuration, we can see that writing 10 to Molder A changes the pin mode to alternate function. But there are many types of alternate functions, so we need to set it to USART2 specifically. The alternate function register can take care of this part. The low registers are for pins 0 to 7, and the high registers for the remaining pins in a port. There are parts we need to care about. Pin 2 should occupy bits 8 to 11, and pin 3 from 12 to 15, since the number Y denotes the pin. We need to write the value of 0, 1 to choose option A, F7, or USART2 for both of these parts. The baud rate requires some calculation, and I leave that part for later. Chapter 19 of the reference manual covers the UART peripheral. To configure the direction in the control register, we need to set the bit of the mode we want to use to 1. RE is receiver enable, and TE is transmitter enable. If you only use it in transmitting mode, then only write to TE and vice versa. Regardless of the mode, we need to write 1 to UE to finally enable the UART peripheral. Coming back to the baud rate calculation, we make our own function to take care of this. We configure the baud rate by writing to the BRR register, BRR stands for bitrate register, and we don't write our intended baud rate directly to this. BRR can be calculated to be the clock source over the baud rate, and the formula is modified in the numerator. The added part is simplified to 0.5, and this is a way to improve accuracy since the value we are calculating will be truncated to the nearest integer below it, and that is correct rounding. Adding 0.5, then the behavior after truncating is equivalent to rounding. If we add 0.5 directly, then the first division will result in an integer, losing the fraction part, and there's no meaning in adding anymore. There are better articles on how to calculate the baud rate. As the way we are doing it is still an approximation, the real baud rate might just be close to 115,200, but not exactly this value. Now let's move on to the second part, which is writing our transmit and receive functions. These functions send and receive one packet or an 8-bit amount of data. The data is stored in the data register, and it can either be transmitted or received data, depending on the context. For our write function, a character is required as a parameter. Before we send, first we check for the TXE flag, which is transmit data register empty. A while loop waits for this condition, the loop ends when TXE is 1 or the data is transferred to the shift register. We write the value we want to send into the data register. Of course, this data has to be formatted, so it has a size of 8 bits, and that explains the AND operation here. The read function is somewhat similar, but we are returning the value of the data register. This time, we are checking for the RXNE flag, or reading data register, not empty. If it is 1, then the data is ready to be read so we can finally read the received data. These write and send functions should only work for one byte. We need to retarget it to print F and scan F to transmit and receive longer messages. Retargeting means changing the IO stream to another peripheral, and in this case, UART. This still needs to be done even if you don't write bare metal and use the HAL layer. We include STDIO and then redefine, put char, and get char. These functions are declared in a syscall.c, and we can redefine these functions.
For printf, we only need to call uart write. But for scanf, we first read, then write the character again to echo this on the console. For the main loop, it's relatively simple. First, we call the init function, then create a string called message. A while true loop is created so we can repeatedly change the value of message in the serial monitor, and then it echoes back the value that we have just written. The output shows that our program is working as intended. And that's it for my basic guide to writing a bare metal UART transmit receive driver. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and as always, you can support my channel by dropping likes and subscribes, or even consider giving a small donation with my info under the description. Hope to see you again in my future video.